Clay is here. No. Okay. Clay, you should sit over there until you find it. Okay. Come on up and walk us through this. Clay Purvis. I'm the director for telecommunications and connectivity with the Department of Public Service. And I'm here today to talk about the 10-year telecommunications plan. This November, we issued a final draft on the 10-year telecommunications plan. Uh, the plan is required to uh, provide a comprehensive overview of, of the telecommunications industry in Vermont and um, discuss priorities for the next 10 years as well as um, policy and uh, uh, re policy recommendations uh, that um, might advance telecommunication goals um, laid out in statute and in the plan. So I think we've done that. We've um, uh, addressed uh, many of the key concerns of our owners, the uh, most important, I uh, think, but the most salient issue. Those uh, first two things, yeah. is that what the statute requires the plan to do? The statute has, and I'm sorry, I actually don't have a copy of the statute. Well, we'll get, you know. we'll have Maria talk with us afterwards. That's okay. Good. I'm happy to call up um, a copy of the statute and read I that. I keep hearing that we may have some issues with the statute, but... I believe we followed the statutory requirements. Um, I, I would welcome uh, a legal opinion on that. If, if not, um, well, no, we may, as time changes, we may want different things than we did when we wrote this statute. So going forward, I think that's something we need. You know, certainly um, a lot of the language in the statute dates back to you know, the, the mid 90s and, and before, so um, uh, certainly uh, uh, probably wouldn't hurt to have an update that uh, reflects modern issues. Um, so, uh, broadband um, is one of the key concerns that we hear about uh, from Vermonters, and certainly uh, one of the most important. Forms of communication um, in our in modern society. So much of the plan um, uh, discusses ways to increase broadband availability in the state. Um, the plan recognizes the cost uh, of broadband is uh, quite significant. Um, you know, we uh, certainly can't uh, cannot. Um, simply authorize or uh, require companies to build out 100% uh, broadband. Um, there are uh, severe federal restrictions on our ability to regulate broadband companies. Um, but there are things we can do um, uh, that can make it easier for um, certainly community-based broadband projects to deploy uh, extend networks. So uh, we've come up with some key recommendations that uh, would certainly help communication union districts, um, as well as other broadband providers uh, increase their networks. We've got some more chairs to down there we can take out. We've got some room up here, anyone that wants to bring a chair up. I would not recommend sitting behind that door because it can get open rather quickly. Okay. <laughs> okay, I think we will uh, at some point get kind of an overview of the statute and of the federal <coughs> wiggle 
room we have within their, their strengths, just to get an idea of what we can do. Okay. Thank you. So I'm happy to walk through some of the recommendations that we've made in the plan, um, some of the key findings. I think the most important issue is that we don't have broadband statewide. So we do a lot of broadband mapping. Um, uh, and we have identified at least 6% of the uh, state uh, residential and business locations lack access to even basic broadband. When we talk about broadband, that meets the federal definition of, um, of what broadband is, 25 megabits per second down, three up. We have 20, over 25% of the state that lacks broadband that speed. And then state statute, we have a So a quarter of the goal. state does not meet state's federal statute for basic broadband. For what they define broadband as, actually, they refer to it as advanced telecommunications, um, advanced telecommunications services. Right, but it's what's necessary to do much more than get email. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Twenty-five three. So that's basically cable service, um, internet over cable. What Comcast or Charter, right. and then in uh, state statute we have a goal of one hundred megabits per second symmetrical, and that is without question requires fiber to the premises to achieve that. <coughs> that's thirteen percent. The state has that. Has that. Yeah. And do we have that locked out? The maps were hard. Follow. So can I assume we've got EC Fiber and we've got Chittenden County? No. Years ago there was some in downtown Montpelier, but I'm not sure how functional that is. On the residential side, you can sum it up with three companies Burlington Telecom, VTEL has fiber to the premises and their telephone exchanges, and then EC Fiber. There are um, other companies that have small amounts of fiber. Then on the commercial and wholesale side, you have lots of fiber um, all over the city. So, um, but those companies. As in, can you define that for us? Sure. Um, companies that would serve large institutions such as uh, government or uh, say global foundries. Global, yeah. Okay, so Hospitals. large yeah. business complexes may have their own, this, this is secondary, second mile, right? First mile is the transmission lines in, second is out, third is to the home, is, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, uh, I think, or yes, excuse me, yes, that's correct. Um, uh, so many companies that operate in Vermont, such as level three or um, AT&T or First Light um, provide fiber services to um, large companies or uh, other telecommunications providers. Okay. Um, we call that middle mile. We have lots of middle mile fiber in Vermont. Um, the real barrier to residential and small business uh, broadband is, is that last mile. It's making the connection from the middle mile to the home. So with those uh, three data points in mind, um, certainly the cost of providing fiber to the premises statewide was addressed in the 2014 plan. Uh, we did high level cost estimates. Um, depending on which model you use, we uh, very much like the EC fiber model. and estimated that cost to do that statewide at about $500 million. <coughs> How much progress have we made in the last 10 years? Well, certainly on the fiber front, uh, I think it's fair to say we've gone from zero to 13%. Um, cable cable infrastructure has increased slightly, uh, and there's been uh, much DSL deployment in Vermont. So um, I don't have exact numbers. Um, of course, the plan looks forward 10 years. Um, we can certainly address in the final copy um, where we've come in the last 10 years. But um, I think it's fair to say that we've made significant progress towards deploying fiber and towards 
providing some level of basic broadband to um, a clear majority of Vermonters. I'm just... You said you don't have specific numbers. Is that on the top of your mind? Or yes. Anywhere in this report or what? Uh, certainly on top of my mind. Um, we have addressed uh, progress made in the last, since the last iteration of the plan. Um, uh, but uh, the, I, I think the spirit of the, the 10 year telecommunications plan is to um, take a look at what we need for the next 10 years. Um, so it, it's a forward looking plan. What is the state of, of technology and communication systems today, and what do we need to get where we want to be within the next 10 years? But this all seems to work on the concept that technology is set. That what we need now is what we're going to need in two years. And I don't think that's how technology works. 20 years ago, there were no laptops. Maybe it was 25, but there were no laptops. Um, Well, certainly the technology that's used to deliver broadband today has been around for a long time. Fiber optic cable has been around since the 70s, uh, used in communications networks. Uh, DSL um, utilizes the same copper infrastructure that has been installed in our homes for a century. But I think we've agreed that DSL is inadequate. Yep. So we're really talking about how do we get fiber out. Yes. And we have, I mean, we have Burlington Electric and we have EC, right? I think Vito was mentioned, but perhaps that's in a single town or two. Mm -hmm. Ten exchanges. I believe, I believe at least ten exchanges. Ten exchanges. Se several towns. Okay. Seven okay. Towns. okay. So, what did they do that this plan says we can learn from? Well, I think when you look at uh, fiber optic networks, at least in this state, I think the one thing they have in common is that they touch public funding. So, or public funding has touched them in some way. So, Burlington Telecom is a municipal <coughs> and uh, plans. EC Fiber is also municipal, though they've done a lot of it on their own um, with some assistance from the state using middle mile fiber networks that we've built uh, that the department completed in uh, 2015, as well as grants that we've given through the Connected Initiative. VTEL received an $80 million grant to do its fiber to the home. It was a federal grant. It was a federal grant, $80 million. So $80 million for, I think, about 15,000 locations that gives you um, a good data point for um, what it would take to do the rest of the state. And is that those locations, like I think we said several towns, is that the entire town yes. or just the downtown area? Or do the folks up on the hills get? They were required to do every location within their telephone exchange. Within the telephone exchange. maybe why it costs so much. Yes, um, certainly doing wall-to-wall -wall fiber is expensive. Um, but I think we've seen in the last few years, especially with the success of EC Fiber uh, Communication Union Districts, we have another one in here in Washington County uh, that encompasses 11 towns. Um, I know 16, that's, 16, 16. That's okay. proposed, I don't know. It's, it's certainly been established. Okay. Uh, they haven't. Uh, not built. It's not built it's yet. It's not built the, yet. The, the, the union is established. Okay. Yeah, I, I know the political or legal spot structure has been set up, but no one's sent me a notice asking me to sign up. Right. 
So I'm feeling I may get one. <laughs> um, but certainly, what can we do to help foster those networks um, in the state? Uh, certainly, there's a lot of interest among communities uh, for establishing these uh, community-based fiber projects. There's also another effort afoot in, um, in Newberry, and as well as Craftsbury did. Um, uh, Not together. No, set, totally separate. Okay. So we have. I was going to say they're a long way apart. Our long way We have these little projects popping up. Some are big, some are small, um, and so uh, I think the plan recognizes the need to uh, uh, make changes to existing state law or policy that could help facilitate development of those did, projects. Did you give us a specific law and policies that need to be changed? There, I'll admit, after yeah. I got through about the first half, I was skim reading. Um, they are identified in the plan. I'm happy to call them out. Um, uh, there is right now a prohibition on bonding or using general obligation bonds. So that's certainly something that uh, the plan recognizes that should be revisited. Um, for municipal bonding? For municipal bonding, yes. Because okay. I know last time we worked on this, which was a was 10 years ago because EC fiber was set to go to bond on the stock market. Am I right, Senator? Keep me honest. Sure, this, uh, this is my memory. Oh, wait, no, no, yeah, yeah, and sure. the bottom fell out and they weren't able to issue their bonds, which was a major setback. Um, At the same time, Madam Chair, I believe VTOL received a substantial grant. From well, then there was recovery money, and there was then there was Irene money that came in um, to recoveries. It's a fair portion of that went to fiber and uh, to telecom, and then and I believe Vtel got a good chunk of that. Um, so. What I'm trying to figure out is how we learn from the past 10 years and apply that to the next 10 years. Is there any kind of regular discourse between the department and these, like EC Fiber and the folks that are trying to spin off from there? Yes. OK. Um, and we certainly, in preparation for the plan, as well as in the regular course of business, we have discussed these ideas with them, um, with uh, many different stakeholders, um, including uh, Central Vermont Fiber, incumbent telephone companies, EC Fiber, and cable companies. So um, I, I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't say that we created the plan in a vacuum. I'm looking for my notes that I wrote. Did, is, it, is it correct that when VTEL built out its fiber network in the towns where it's built out, they were the incumbent providers at the time of the build out? Yes, yeah. So uh, towns or exchanges in which they are the rural local exchange carrier, they are like. So while VTEL was similar to Fairpoint and being. One was an incumbent carrier in one place, or point was an incumbent carrier somewhere else. VTEL got a federal grant and Fairpoint didn't. Is that the reason for their why VTEL built out? Uh, yes, the, the VTEL received a particular grant, with, and the grant requirement was to build fiber premises. For the purpose of building fiber premises. Yes, so Fairpoint. Now, Consolidated Communications does receive significant federal assistance from the FCC for Vermont to the tune of $50 million to do DSL service. So, to do DSL, service. to do DSL, they're required to bring DSL to about 24,000 locations in Vermont. 24,000 new locations? Just like, what's the I believe it's 24,000 locations uh, in a designated service territory, so what we call their high-cost territory. 
whether they're supposed to bring DSL of 10 megabits per second down one up, whether they already serve some number of those customers, whether it's a matter of just bringing up the bandwidth from, say, 4.1 or 7.1 to 10.1, mm -hmm. or if they're truly serving uh, customers that heretofore haven't had any service whatsoever. I think that remains to be seen. The, in, I believe that Vito also received a, a subsidy to enable them to put towers up to, to reach the places that were reachable. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so that's a separate project. It's a separate project. It's a, it, and in both cases where the VTEL received the, uh, the money to do this, were they required to meet any, um, you know, to stay within any maximum uh, fees or charges to, to sell the service to the folks in, in that area? I do believe there was a requirement to offer a $10 a month service. For dial tone or for uh, internet services? In the WOW, so the, the wireless project, there was a $10, I believe there was a $10 um, broadband package they were supposed to offer. And they certainly, I, when they rolled out the service, I remember there being a $10. But this is broadband that can do basically email. But if I wanted to download research for my high school paper, I would have a hard time doing it in a reasonable amount of time. With VTEL's WOW service, I think that depends. Uh, they were required to bring broadband of at least 768 kilobits per second down, 200 kilobits per second up, which is less than one meg, so less than one one, uh, or less, uh, far less than what a basic DSL package would provide. With that said, uh, in many areas they far exceeded that. In some areas we found recently that they had no service at all. So um, it's hard to say what the service is and uh, in any given place who has good access to it, who doesn't. Um, but so we don't know, just like the cell service. I mean, we did the drive around. We know you get a bar in this location, but we don't know if it's a Verizon bar or if it's an AT&T bar or somebody else's. Because I remember the discussion the other day with their service here and their service here, but we don't know driving down the interstate or driving from my house to my kid's school or my office if the provider that provides me at my home also provide service at my kid's school or my place of employment because there are some places where um, there's one provider that predominates if you stand in the kitchen and you know wave your cell phone out the window you might get the other provider but basically we've got areas where there either is no reliable service or only one provider service, and that may or may not be the provider that provides for other important places that I need to go or contact. So I guess, how much money have we got to do this with? What's our funding source? In state or out of state? So I, I mean, I think there are two both. How much months. money have we got to do Certainly. internet to Vermont? So in state, uh, we have a couple of grant programs. So we have the connectivity initiative. So okay, but what's the source of that? The Vermont Universal Service Fund. Okay, that is our primary source of revenue to do internet, right? Right now, right. Uh, for building infrastructure. Yes. Okay. How much is that? Oh, this year we're giving uh, in grants, we have $220,000. Okay. 
So we figure about two thousand dollars in address. Maybe That's what you, but you just told us it cost eighty million to do. Fifteen thousand. Yeah. Yep. So we have. Can we say we have very limited funds? <laughs> I think that's a fair. That's what I yeah. thought. And that and the universal service fund is funded by. Uh, it is funded by a fee that we all pay on our telephone bills. Right. Right. It also pays for a couple of other key services. The biggest being E911. So this is kind of a stepchild that got added on. It also does the lifeline. Lifeline, mm -hmm. and yeah. it does the TDY, right? Yeah, T. Uh, yes. Yeah, the that, TRS yes. Too, yeah. And there's all right. A regular so, stepchild. Is that on mobile phones too? What's that? It's on mobile phones as well, right? Um, it is on all tele all voice services. So uh, whether it's um, a mobile phone or a landline phone, you pay the 2% on the retail amount, yes. So that's our revenue source. And we've got another revenue source. <laughs> there are, so the, the plan has um, identified a couple of issues uh, with revenue. Certainly we need money to build infrastructure. We do have a grant program in place to do that but also planning funding. So uh, folks at um, Central Vermont Fiber um, or AC Fiber could have access to capital to build or to plan future builds. Okay, um, so we, oh, yeah. we have $220,000 for infrastructure a year to do that. And Think Vermont, which is another grant program, is providing very small grants that could be used for planning purposes. And where is that money? The Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Okay. Tiny. Tiny. Hmm? Tiny. Okay. Okay. How do okay. So we've identified one problem. We have no money. Yep. Okay. How do other states uh, get their funding? I mean, is it a similar process? Uh, a lot of states are starting broadband projects. Um, if you look toward Massachusetts, They've got a broadband project. I mean, do they have a, a similar you know, universal service fee that's, that's a percentage of the bill? Some states fund broadband mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. Others are just doing uh, bonding. So Massachusetts doing $20 million, um, in capital bonding. So other states are doing things through the capital bill? Yes. And would you excuse my ignorance, why did you say we bonding's off the table? I thought you had said that earlier on. Municipal. 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 Oh, there's a prohibition on municipal, municipal bonding, bonding for right. general obligation right. bonds right but now. But we can bond because okay. this okay. lasts more than 20 years, in theory at least more than 20 years. Have we done any bonding for broadband? We have. 300,000 went into the connectivity initiative two years ago. <laughs> I know. I know these numbers are killing me. Clay, you're killing me. We put in five bucks. I wonder why we're not connected. <laughs> Okay, Sorry. compared to what we've put in to clean up the lake or build prisons, <laughs> this has been a very, this has been a drop in the bucket. But the governor has what in his budget this uh, year? A million, I believe. That's, Where is that from? Yes. Ah, first we have a real number. Okay, so there's a million in general fund revenue? Uh, yes, that's being devoted to uh, a couple of items, the connectivity initiative, uh, Think Vermont to do more planning style grants, and uh, there's also um, an initiative to uh, create a VITA loan fund. So mm -hmm. To do that, okay. And I'm kind of hoping this might be something we're doing with okay. our one time money. I'm just going to ask, is it yeah. one time? I or believe it is. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so, oh, oh. I, the question of the earlier, two of us, the old I, I, house members, keep raising our hands. The, oh, yeah, the sorry. questions that you asked about and how you tell. serve, yeah. and and others. One of Vermont's problems is it's not flat. So when you're right. trying to compare to other yeah. states, mm -hmm. it's not where you can serve hundreds of thousands of people right. with towers. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Um, in Vermont, you can only serve uh, mm -hmm. the handful. Yeah. Yes. Thousands yeah. with yeah. towers. So That's those are really not clear. apples to apples yeah. questions. And while the right. answers are appear discouraging to us all, but they are they are based on geography, which I means our yeah. challenges. Geography and so, commitment so, too, Senator. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm being nice. I know you are, and I appreciate it. I said before, my daughter was in but, um, Senegal. With, 
no, no running water and no electricity, but, but she, had. she had cell phones. Because it's flat and you put up power. Oh, so the, 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 the witness in the position of giving accurate answers, which don't explain the, yeah. the questions you're, you're seeking to. Okay, so we've yes. gotten one problem is that we do not have the capital revenue to make the investment. That's correct. And we are depending on federal revenue and private investment. That's correct, yes. Which to date, has been woefully inadequate. Or in some places. In some places. Like, well, or poorly distributed. Has there been anything? By whom? Vitals towns are served in the incumbent area by a massive grant of stimulus money from the federal government. Right. Fair points were not. Mm -hmm. um, they were in The central Washington County, central Vermont yep. area is seeking to copy um, EC Fiber. Mm -hmm. EC Fiber's advantage was, back 15 or 20 years ago, that they picked an area where no one basically got any service. So when they invest money, they can count on lots and lots of people signing up. In. And they have, a, they have a, a, a revenue source out there desperately waiting to sign up. I suggest that the central Vermont area has more problems <laughs> with more piecemeal cable mm -hmm. services which means when they provide the same amount of build out, they'll get they'll likely get much lower sign up rates to start uh -huh. with. So the profitability of, right. of, of their success is greatly diminished by their geography and past history. I think that's right. fairly accurate. You've described the donut hole problem. Yeah. Yep. And it's, they're going to need those of us downtown to sign up in order to get to Calus, which. Right. Is, just a couple of questions. The, the prohibition on municipal bonds, who, who is that the our bond rate? Where, where does that prohibition come from? It's actually in state statute. So a state statute limits bonding for telecommunications plan to revenue bonds only. Okay. Would you care to okay. say that that was lobbied in great force by independent uh, providers of broadband who wanted to make sure that towns didn't provide their own broadband and put Burlington's right. experience on the stage to argue on behalf of their kids. Yeah. Well, that's where we had to give us a kind of a comment on that one. Okay. Yeah, when it happened. I'm, I'm sure that's true. And Burlington, <coughs> I remember those bonds were revenue bonds. And it was, mm -hmm. you know, and then it got more hamstrung to read every bureaucratic stuff it made. If we were having this discussion in a town hall that was not expertly moderated, people would be screaming at the rafters and, and throwing tomatoes at all of us. And, and I, I'm experiencing a little frustration and not having any sense of urgency or crisis from, from you guys who are, you know, admittedly only to get to sit here. I know more than you work on it. But I'm looking at the page 14 on the, the goals that we have in statute of getting, you know, it's, it's sort of laid out from 2014 to 2017. Mm -hmm. We'll get our universal sort of laughable rate of four and one, and then we'll move on to boosting that to 10. So we're not there. Okay. We're, we're closing in. We have a year to go. On where one. we're supposed to be 10 one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> are we about to get to the point where you tell us how we're going to come close to achieving this, or where we just decide this is a, not even worth pretending it's a realistic goal, or what? I mean, people, this is a, uh, a conversation that we've been having for now three governors, uh, every campaign cycle that people run for office in this state, this topic is over and over and over again. And it is uh, more than a little discouraging to feel like we maybe don't even have a plan. Um, so I wonder if you could just sort of walk us through some of the, now what do we do? Sure. 
So uh, I would like to dispel the notion that um, we're not uh, concerned or we don't feel that this is um, an urgent situation. We certainly do, my staff and I, this is what we do. Um, and I talk to Vermonters every day who don't have Vermont, uh, who don't have uh, internet access service. Um, I also talk to Vermonters every day whose telephone lines are down for good. I mean, they're, you know, weeks without uh, someone to come to repair their lines. Uh, certainly, um, this is a, um, a scary proposition that we could be faced in the future with a world where uh, telecom is completely unregulated and folks don't even have access to basic telephone. We can certainly be go we could be going backwards. Um, so I think the sense of urgency is there. Um, we are hamstrung by federal law, which prohibits states from exercising any regulatory authority whatsoever over broadband internet access services. We are very limited in our ability to exercise uh, regulatory authority over telephone services that are not offered by the incumbent telephone providers. So new voice over IP, wireless service, we don't, we can't touch it on the regulatory front. Uh, on the kind of economic development front, uh, which I think we just established, there isn't a lot of funding there. Um, this is, is cost-wise, it's a monumental problem. And when you look at what the federal government is investing here in Vermont with the Connect America Fund, um, $50 million to consolidate it, um, the, uh, the rural local exchange carriers are all getting significant investments from the Connect America Fund. The Mobility Fund is a $4.5 billion fund for the nation. For the nation. For the nation, um, I think we should see some of that. Um, and that would do what? That would bring mobile wireless 4G LTE service to areas that lack it today. Um, we can tighten some folks up. Yeah. Yeah. I just got to request to testify, so. Okay, so maybe that, I think we know what the fiber, the, the problem is. We're, we're probably not going to make the goal for this coming year, never mind for the next 10 years. We also met the last goal. Yeah, we haven't met the last goal. But if we've got the rest of the year to do it, we probably are not going to do it. We have very limited if any ability to regulate, force, strongly incentivize private carriers to make the significant investment to get out to that last mile, never mind to upgrade the present mile because there isn't competition. I mean, if this is what my carrier gives to my town, this is what I get. Um, so we don't have competition, which means that we need public programs. And money. Well, yes, public I mean, programs really mean money. Uh, somebody needs to make the investment to, mm -hmm. to do this. I mean, would you agree with that? I mean, if you had more money, I would build more profit. <laughs> okay. And then, so we need to find money. Now, this year, it sounds like there's a million dollars going somewhere in connectivity, but it sounds like that brought that million is getting spread out over three kind of areas. But if that 2% tax, I'm not saying we would do this, were a 5% tax, you would have a lot more money. Which you could, could, could use. I can't disagree with that. Okay. Yeah. We, we, we know that the for the governor cannot support taxes, so we don't need to put in that. We don't work with it. But we, what it sounds like one of the things we need is a, a reliable source of funding. And how do we bring it up? Did we increase what we put 
connectivity on to the universal service charge. Did we raise the universal service charge? Yes, it was set at a flat 2% in statute. So what was it before that? I'd actually look to something 1.8. It, it varied five. That's right. It went in. I remember that. Why do I have an image of a garden gate? But that's the one I had that. It went in. It depended on how much we used. Exactly. And at that point, it was E911 and the... Uh, the the budgets of the three programs, yeah. we set it based on the previous year's budget and collect that amount. So yep. it was always capped at two. Okay, so that's it was, right. It was we from one to two, two. It was, you know, up and down. It was minimal, mm -hmm. if you think about the cost of doing anything. But at that point, we also had recovery money coming in. So, okay. And then there's how do we spend it? I mean, EC Fiber has chosen an area. Do we choose areas that, and perhaps concentrate all our money in one place, and do an EC Fiber in Concord or north of St. J somewhere, or do we? just kind of buckshot it and do a little bit in a lot of places, which is something to think about. It's certainly a, a difficult question. Uh, one of the problems is that, and I think you described this, it's folks at the end of the dirt road. Right. So there's a person here, there's a person there. Um, they're not in a confined geographic area. So the question becomes, do you um, extend existing networks, or do you overbuild um, existing networks and reach those folks with, with a different solution? Um, and I think that that is um, a big question. Certainly with the connectivity initiative, it's geared towards getting to first funding the locations that have nothing. So the reason we focus our efforts on folks that have something less than 401 is because that's that's not functional broadband anymore. Um, so we were spending the majority of our money um, trying to extend existing networks to reach those areas. So we've certainly given a lot of grants to EC Fiber um, to do line extensions um, down certain roads. We've also given money to um, incumbent telephone carriers to do DSL. Uh, actually, uh, an investment in DSL is also an investment in fiber because they are removing copper from their network and replacing it with fiber, shortening the loop lengths. So as if we they're say. doing why would we give grants for DSL right now? Well, I think there are two reasons. Um, the first is that many of the totally unserved population live in areas where there is no other low-cost alternative to broadband. So if you pick a town, um, Wheelock. 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 Yeah. Wheelock, I like Wheelock. Anybody um, up there in the um, Northeast Kingdom? There may not be uh, an existing provider or another provider uh, like uh, a community fiber project ready to take on those addresses. The incumbent telephone company might be the only one. Um, and so it might be the best to sit, uh, the best choice even though it's not the perfect choice. Okay. Just in, in Berkshire, they had a telephone service. Wires were so old and discrepant that they, the phone calls, the phone, just regular phone calls would lapse when things got wet and soggy. And um, Fairpoint rebuilt the phone lines out on the back roads with new copper wire to replace the old copper wire. And when you build out on the old back roads, um, 70 some percent of the cost of building out has to, is labor, not the materials. And yet Fairpoint made a business decision to build out with copper 
old world tech, yesterday's technology instead of fiber. And you would say, well, why did they do that? And one of the reasons they did it was because they had a monopoly out there and there was no, there was no, they had no interest because they had a captured audience. Um, the other reason they did it was because it was cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, those are the, that's the type of challenge that is being unaddressed. Mm -hmm. We have, I'm, I'm watching the time, I've got one more from Sen uh, Jeremy Hansen from Central Vermont Fiber who wants to talk to us. And so I'm going to kind of compress maybe a break, uh, but keep us moving. Clay, we'll have you back. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm sure you're thrilled by that thought. Because this is just our first, I mean, it's, it's massive, it's complex, and if, as far as I'm concerned, if this is our 10-year plan, we're just killing trees. I mean, because I read as much of this, and I still, I got a lot of history, which was good, and I got a lot of could or should enact policies, but nothing about what those policies were, you know? So I don't know where to start in here if we're supposed to legislate policy or action to start because that's your tech field. I don't know that. Um, and I'm looking, I think, for something we can hang our hat on and maybe say in the next X years we're going to do this, and this is how we're going to do it. And then in something less than 10 years, we will know if we have, in fact, been able to wire the village of Concord or Wheelot or Guildhall was um, in the news recently as a town that's dying. Uh, this is what we did. Or we got, I mean, personally, I'd like to get cell service to Calus. I mean, yeah. Um, even Route 12, but, uh, you know, I mean, that's 10 miles from the, the, the state capital, and unless things have improved radically, last time I tried to call out there, I had to drive to East Montpelier to get cell service. Um, that's a long way to go in an emergency. So, well, I think to Senator Pearson's point, which is, we need leadership on this issue. And if the leadership isn't coming from whatever administration is in there, because Senator McDonald was saying four governors, not three, but four, mm -hmm. and you're working as hard as you can in your shop with the limited resources that you have, it is it's an issue of leadership. And if it is not going to happen at the executive level, then it needs to happen here. here. And we need to ask for the money that we need, and we have to figure out where it's coming from and how we're going to spend it. Because it's from the cities, and it's going to go to the countryside. And then the answer is, no. Well, I'm I'm a glass half full, Mark McDonald. <laughs> maybe one, He's just a glass one other, or maybe I have one of the EC's fighters' mm -hmm. success in doing what they're doing is is a detriment to everyone else who's trying to get broadband service because they have <laughs> uh, in an economic situation of no one being served. Right. And it's a handy thing to say, well, how come this area isn't getting served? They said, because they don't have the gumption that EC Fiber had to go Understood. out and pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Right. No, they had they don't have the they they don't have the economic model that right. works out there. And right, right. So and so the conditions are different on the ground. Maybe for all we these communities. find some of the communities that do. Because there are. Are you saying Senator the Marshall Islands actually has internet now? Um can we stop calling them the Marshall Islands? They have, they have become annoyingly effective and, uh, and have, and probably are going to say, we succeeded, you should be able to. All we need to do is get you a stoplight and you have joined the 21st century. I don't represent a stoplight and I don't wish to. Thank you. <laughs> I don't wish to. Okay. Okay, thank you, Clay. Right, thank you very much. But I think you, you've got, we're, we're trying to get something that's 
It's um, measurable, that's doable, and we need to get a price tag. Then it's our job to figure out if we can get it and where. Before, could I ask Clay one, one more question again? I was asking about this last time you were here, but the wireless, you know, here on your note says, Department believes many potentially underserved locations have access to 401 service to wireless providers. But we don't know. Um, I get that we don't regulate them and in that sense, but we do regulate the towers and we do have a hand on them in, in some fashion. They're corporations in the state of Vermont. So are they not responding to like letter requests or what's the process where we're trying to glean this information? And I, I only ask because it has been presented in the last many years that the wireless strategy is the way we finish this up in those hard to reach areas. And I, it's kind of mind boggling that we can't actually measure or not whether or not we've done it. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I three points about wireless. Um, knowing simply where the infrastructure is, so in the plan there is a, a map of where we've issued 248A applications to a good sense of where towers are. Um, even if we knew where the towers, which we do, where the towers were exactly, which antennas are on them and at what height and where they're pointed and at what power level, um, the, the best you could do with that is create a propagation map. And propagation maps, in my opinion, are garbage. Uh, they don't do anything helpful for anyone. The best way to determine where we have wireless service on the ground and where we don't is to drive it. And we did that. So I think since this plan came out, this draft, um, I think we have much better data as to where we have wireless service and where we don't. And we'll certainly include those findings uh, in our uh, final adopted plan. Okay. Other, other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Steve. Hi. I'm ready. Questions I'm hearing from the committee. Uh, I think you've hit the nail and on the for head. For the record, we all know who we are. Stephen Whitaker. Um, last evening, I reread a four page letter I wrote regarding the failings of the telecommunications planning process. And you gave that to us, right? No, this one I wrote in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, and I pointed out that the department cannot no longer be allowed to adopt its own plan without an objective review of whether or not it's complete and it meets the statutory requirements. That's what current law allows. And I applaud the chair's wisdom in canceling the December 25th joint meeting with Energy and Tech because that's the last checkbox that they needed to. Right. Whether you voted or took action or fell asleep, it wouldn't matter. They would then adopt this hollow excuse of a plan. Um, here, there was a request I heard. Here is the uh, statute of 202C. Those are the state policy and goals, all on two pages. And 202D, the planning request. Is this your job? No. no. OK. She's, she's out of the room. Hi, puppy. Hi, sweetie. 
So this is 202D. These are the planning requirements. I don't know. This was a special request. If anyone is allergic or afraid of dogs, we will no. have a break. I'm afraid of forfeiting my limited time. No, you should not. Yes. Okay. For a shaggy dog story. For a shaggy dog story. This is okay. 202D. I think right. in that way. Yeah. You've got C, Senator. That's D. Okay. 202C is policy and planning. 202D is the planning requirements and process. Both have been. <laughs> Both have been sorely neglected for many years. And what I'm going to have to, in order to save time and stay organized, except for responding to questions, I'm going to kind of read an organized script. Uh, call me a fool or an optimist. We're in an opportune place at the moment. We have long-term failures in planning, governance, and oversight. Uh, we've got a newfound awareness of the size of the stakes. We've got imminent large procurements that can potentially be redirected in a proper direction. Specifically, immediate ones are a proposed rumored 20-year contract on managing the state's neutral host microcells. That needs to be put on pause until there's a plan, foundation, and a propagation study to support it. A $12 million five-year 911 contract, which would be uh, not only a missed opportunity, but an unsafe purchase in the context of the vulnerabilities that have recently been revealed in the existing underlying network. So we've got increasing, increased and emerging capacity in the legislature to tackle these problems. So you, meaning the Senate Finance Committee, but also GovOps institutions, the Joint Information Technology Oversight Committee, and the House Energy and Tech Committee, will need to no longer cast a casual glance, but to really dig in and investigate what's about to go haywire, what has already gone haywire, and where the immediate opportunities exist to redirect state efforts and funding back towards compliance with the statutory policy and goals. Much of the money that you're discussing right now is investing in DSL, and I have some details of this. I was restra refrain restraining from handing it to Senator McDonald. Uh, of the connectivity fund, Comcast was granted over half a million dollars, $516,000 to build more cable modem service in one area of Norwich, $16,000 per address. So that money is being wasted because we also have a statutory policy in 202C to not build technology which will soon be outmoded. So we're ignoring the fundamental policy. It was in Norwich, not the kingdom. Norwich that was in Norwich. Is not a, a, a poor, underserved Correct. community. That, okay. That's why I mentioned it. Details. <laughs> Fairpoint was granted $732,000 to extend DSL service, which will soon be outmoded, or I would argue already is, out of the connectivity fund. EC Fiber, I have no complaints. They got over half a million to build fiber to the premises. Pair Networks, 50,000. Waitsfield faced in 61,000. So I have not made multiple copies of that, but well, if you get one, you will get it at least up online. So on one page, this count, this documents the public dollar investments since the ARRA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, to, to who it went to. And it's an enormous amount of money. And the problem is that all this money was spent in the absence of a telecom plan. The telecom plan is supposed to be the policy basis guiding these investments. And we haven't had a duly adopted, we've never had an infrastructure-based plan, and we haven't had a duly adopted plan since 2004. So that's a failure of oversight. That's a failure of the department's uh, adhering to statute. And there's no accountability, there's no penalties for ignoring the statute. Commissioner O'Brien ignored 
the telecom plan through two full iterations. We never. The 2007. Either. The 2007 plan was never even drafted. The 2010 plan was never even drafted, and it wasn't until I came from traveling and working out of state, came back in 13, and that's when the plan was ordered. It came out of this committee. A plan was ordered to be created in 14, and the 100-100 symmetric goal was put into statute. So that is reachable, but we've already lost five years because of the failure of planning. So I'm going to give it back to my script in order to make best use of the time. Uh, it's going to take a long time to fix the specific problems that I'm prepared to inform you about today. Some will require years and succession at the PUC and the department. In the interim, get a telecommunications plan underway by a professional engineering contractor, engineering firm, whose professional reputation means more than politics. Build this plan on a GIS inventory of all of the telecommunications infrastructure in the state that is clearly visible on the polls. I'm not asking for circuit diagrams that could be used for nefarious purposes. If it's visible on the polls in the public right of way, it needs to be documented and owned and a fiber count of available fibers that can be made available to CV fiber, EC fiber, et cetera, and a price per mile of leasing that fiber. Proceed to complete a statewide wireless propagation analysis and drive test. I agree with I partially agree with Clay. A propagation analysis is useful because it shows you what areas you need to drive most importantly and most frequently as you improve wireless service. The propagation analysis is a inex less expensive in computer modeling, but you also need to do the drive tests. We need to build that capacity in the state. Half measures like the department did with six telephones in a cardboard box or what the first net effort is proposing to do, which is to use first responders carrying around Android phones. It doesn't work on iPhones. They're going to carry Android phones around, and they're only going to map AT&T's coverage. They're not going to map. A pro That's another thing that you need to put a pause on, because the department has signed a Department of Public Safety, has signed a contract with Televate, and Televate thinks they're going to own that data, even though it's collected by our municipal first responders in the course of agency business. To me, that's a public record. There's also a severe privacy issue in that this data will be in the hands of Televate, a corporation, and subject to subpoena. And if a first emergency response goes sideways, and there's a paper trail of certain first responders parked at the bar for four hours prior, that could have devastating consequences. So that's going to get to a future discussion in GovOps about IT planning. Yes. Our IT planning has to deal with privacy and access issues. Right. Okay. So read <laughs> Just a real basic question, because you alluded to it, but is there any statute in Vermont law that says a utility telecommunications company, the PUC, or the department has to follow this plan? Yes, I'm going to get to that. Uh, it, it's only the only effective teeth, teeth in the, of the telecommunications plan right now have to do with advisory on the disposition of the connectivity grants. That's optional. The Telecommunications and Connectivity Advisory Board, which is a statutory body, has not been able to meet or get a quorum, has never even had the vacancies filled for over a year now. It's they haven't advisory. met. And so last year's proposals to increase the, the Universal Service Fund charge were not advised by this commission. The commission hadn't met to discuss it. Uh, they haven't met. They couldn't get a quorum for last September's meeting. They didn't meet. They canceled last January's meeting. Do other states have but let me finish. long term plans that do have teeth? Let, 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 me, let me finish answering that. The, the more important place, and it's in my following testimony, is in the Public Utilities Commission's review of incentive regulations plans. So in, can I get to that? Can I, yes, there, there is a requirement for consistency with the telecom plan, an affirmative finding of consistency with the telecom plan before an incentive reg plan has been approved. 
The problem is the PUC has ignored that for years, including while our current Commissioner of Public Service was general counsel for the PUC, PSP. Okay. We're going to stay out of personnel. Okay. Bill, building out new copper to replace old copper version was a violation of the, of the plan, which prohibits you using yesterday's technology mm -hmm. for new stuff. Okay. And that happened. Okay, so we will make that clearer in the statute, which I have a feeling we're going to get up. Okay, to not result in widespread installation of technology that becomes outmoded within a short period of time after mm -hmm. installation. Mm -hmm. And that would, in effect, in my mind, rule prohibit any connectivity money or any approval of a plan or an incentive reg plan that continues to build anything other than fiber. Because fiber is our statutory goal for 2024, fiber speed connections and, okay. So proceed with a statewide pro wireless propagation study, drive test verification of all wireless carriers and certainly including the allegedly secret AT&T planned coverage being built over the next five years with the $25 million that Governor Scott forfeited to AT&T at the end of last year without any legislative approval. That was for the first net opt-in decision where NTIA had 25 million, had stated they have 25 million available to Vermont and instead we defaulted into a secret plan that we have no control over. And we're not even allowed to see the contract between FirstNet and AT&T. So far, that's subject to federal that's litigation. Okay. That's not a public record? FirstNet thinks that they're exempt from federal FOIA as well. And this is on appeal is in- Is it public money? Oh yes, it's public money. Okay. And it's public spectrum. It, the, the value, in addition to the 25 million that Governor Scott forfeited, he forfeited 30 million worth of valuable band 14 spectrum, which is licensed by the FCC for use with high power user equipment, meaning that the, you can reach a tower that's twice as far away. And though that's not gonna affect your iPhone or your cell phone, but an ambulance mounted hotspot, yeah. that's where that would be most valuable. Right. So we need to proceed and investigate whether we can sublicense, the state can sublicense that band 14 spectrum from AT&T and deploy it on our microcells. I think you're getting above our pay grades. But my point is, in pausing the microcell, you, we risk the department entering giving a 20 year exclusive contract for my- So I've, I've got that on my things to look for, which okay. is, the fiber microcell and the 911 contract. So, if it can be determined to be feasible, combine the cellular propagation mapping with a study of the land mobile radio. That's the brick size radios that most first responders carry. Those are, they're unique from cell phones in that they can talk directly to each other without having to hit a tower. That's called, you know, peer to peer mode. Uh, and those land mobile radio will continue to exist for at least the next decade in public safety. Getting those so they could talk to each other was a major step. We had several crises where the fire and police couldn't talk to each other, they couldn't talk to the state police, they couldn't talk to the... Um, I understand, yeah. but there's, there's still a lot of dead zones for land oh, mobile yeah. radio across Vermont. And it is possible, we need to investigate whether it's possible to map the, the LMR frequencies simultaneous to while we're collecting the cellular propagation data. That's an efficiency that shouldn't be overlooked. Um, this mapping and resolution of public safety radio coverage is essential to inform ongoing discussions and plans for consolidated dispatch statewide which at this time doesn't fall under the responsibilities of any state agency. So I have a, a letter from uh, the only active and independent member of the Public Safety Broadband Network Commission. He's a radio engineer. He is able to uh, inform you and I'll pass that out at the end so that, uh, but in any case, Lacking a telecommunications plan that also addresses LMR radio 
we're, we're not able to gain the efficiencies that we need to do. The point that Ron Kumitz, he's an Alberg fire chief, makes in his letter, is that there's a one-time opportunity here that we risk missing because as these 30 new towers are going up that AT&T is building as part of FirstNet, and I'm sure they'll tell you that was a trade secret I just revealed. Uh, the, that's this is Vermont, trust me, towers are not going up without a deep public knowledge. That, but that opportunity, that time of planning and permitting is the opportunity to get first responders, repeaters of these LMR radios on at favorable terms or even free. Once, the, once those towers go up without these tenants, the, it's much harder and more expensive to negotiate those things. Um, Can I ask another process question? Yeah. Um, so what you're trying to ask here is in several areas for us to improve the plan? No, I'm asking yeah. for you to start over and just have a professionally written plan for the first time ever founded on infrastructure. Fair enough. but. And then change the law so that you do need to approve it, or a body other than the department needs to approve it. Okay. And did you make these comments to, in the hearings here, to the department or whoever? I made many comments, not regarding the approval, because that wasn't the context of those I, public I have hearings. I have a transcript. He, Senator Strzokin so, does as well. So, did they respond to your comments in writing? No, they don't respond to comments. I've been, about in fact, hearings? Correct. Yeah, they asked him to speed up because we were running out of time. And, and well, I was the only one. He was the only person okay. at the public hearing. Mm -hmm. Now, also, <laughs> I mean, we, have, we have to sort of short circuit some of this. I have, we have a law in, with LCAR, if someone makes a comment, even though the department doesn't like it, they're, sorry, they're forced to respond to that comment. Mm -hmm. So you can see what the pros and cons are. Th those folks work for us. Whereas these are private businesses, so. No, I think no, I'm talking about whoever writing whoever the plan. Whoever testifies. Oh, writing the plan. Okay, yeah. yeah so you make comments and sense. you get a response to the comments. Yeah. That's nonsense or that's important. We rejected it for this. Okay. And put us one step that, ahead. The, the Joint Legislative Telecom Study Committee in 1992 came out Where with five. Are predating me around? Came out with those recommendations. This is the foundation. I, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna, on advice of Senator Brock, uh, tell us what you're gonna tell us, then tell us, and then tell us what you told us. That's uh, right. Pause the $12 million five-year E911 procurement, which is scheduled for a vote tomorrow in the E911 board. The E911 board thinks that they are not subject to PSB PUC jurisdiction for the E911 system. Uh, pause the Public Service Department's imminent award of a 20-year contract for microcell management. Pause the FirstNet first net Televate uh, AT&T only propagation mapping being done with the privacy and access implications that I raised. Uh, mandate an immediate inventory of any Huawei equipment. The federal government is serious about this. Our national security agencies have raised the red flag I've been told by VTEL owner that they are being asked to interconnect with First Light, and First Light has Huawei equipment in it, which could potentially open a big security hall. I, I'm not confirming or denying it's above my pay grade of how big that risk is, but we have to take it seriously in that the nations around the world and the federal government are taking it seriously. Uh, I'm not saying stop, I'm saying mandate an inventory so that we know how big the problem is. Uh, make plans, make affirmative plans for a summer study for this committee or the Joint Tech Committee to adequately dive into these issues because they are way bigger than you're going to be able to do. You have those bullets yes. for us? Yes. This is the call me a fool or an optimist. Okay. okay. I'll pass Go 10 that copies would, around. That would give us something to start working on. Okay. I'm okay. going to... I'm going to again tell you that you really need a complete plan. We, we, we need a really good plan, and we need it very soon. Those who chose, choose to ignore history are doomed to repeat it, even if it was before your time. Any tell you, any tell it was before everybody's time. I was here. Uh, in fact, the transcripts of the 2014 hearings, 
all the comments and advice and recommendations were pretty much ignored in the draft you're seeing in 2019. So uh, I can't fix the department. We need to have an engineering firm do a plan. And maybe as the department regains its bearings, you can hand it back to the department. Any 10-year tel telecommunications plan lacking specifics, lacking long-range vision, analysis of alternatives, costs, benefits, and actionable strategies is no plan at all. Any plan that fails to chart a clear path or even several alternative paths to reach each of the statutory policy goals of 202C is not a plan, but more of an aspirational road sign, a primer, or a pretense. The single most important goal in the statute is number 10, bring fiber speed connections to every E91 address by 2024. At this juncture, I think that you will need to direct that the plan, at least this version, be put out to a bid. The long overdue plan founded on a comprehensive inventory of our existing infrastructure must include wireless propagation mapping, accurately documenting Vermont's sparse cell coverage, I've already spoken to that. Vermonters are being asked to climb a steep learning curve to engage and participate in this statutorily defined planning process. Yet at every step, the companies, the department, or the commission assert that we're not allowed to or we don't need to know or see the details about where our telecommunications facilities are. It's absolutely necessary to know the details of the infrastructure, how many fiber strands are available for lease, where, where the interconnect fiber access points are that are publicly funded from the capital bill, uh, and at what cost <coughs> we could connect to that fiber. CV Fiber shouldn't need to plan to build new fiber across all these towns, 15, 16 towns. If there's existing fiber owned by First Light, Sovereign Ed, VTEL, uh, Comcast even, we should be able to lease that fiber at least for the first few years from point to point and save those bills. I'll mention one other thing that needs to be considered, it's not in my written testimony, is that the state on every permit it has granted through <coughs> for the building of fiber has put a permit condition on there for many years. It says the state may for its own purposes overlash its own fiber to these facilities at no cost. That would mean no, po no a monthly annual poll rent, no make ready costs, no make ready delays. We could in effect lash middle mile dark fiber owned by the state to and, and get the cost from 30 to 23, possibly down as low as $10,000 a mile. That, that's a significant strategy that needs to be explored. There could likely be a legal challenge to the, for its own purpose, but I believe that it would be sustained based on the economic development priorities of the state to make dark available as long as the dark fiber is made available on a non-discriminatory basis to it, all comers. Is that how we built Velcro? Yes. So regulatory, regulated utilities typically plan for 10, 20, even 30 years in the future. Elected state administrations plan for just two, maybe four years. Consolidated acquired Fairpoint for about a billion and a half worth of fiber and is said to have gambled the additional 300 million on the copper switches in real estate. During the period between 2000 now and 2004, that's when our last telecom plan was, duly adopted telecom plan was created, we've invested over a quarter billion dollars of public money in this infrastructure and we don't all without knowing where it is or being guided by the policy basis of statute. Our economy is now paying a steep price for this lapse with our young people leaving the state, our community media organizations at risk, repeated 911 system failures, legislative state government libraries repeatedly going offline for hours at a time simply due to a squirrel munching on a fiber sheet or a backhoe accident, and still thousands of Vermonters are frequently unable to call for help in an emergency or for days at a time when extended power outages or wireless dead zones disrupt and fr frustrate essential communications. These are the costly results of poor planning. I believe that the department has for years, possibly for decades, intentionally skipped plan rewrites, neglected final drafts, or otherwise watered down 
and marginalize the importance of the state plan, possibly to incur political favors or to grease the approval of the incentive break plans for the dominant ILEC, be it Bell Atlantic, Verizon, Fairpoint, now consolidated. In short, in short, the department has lost its regulatory planning and public advocacy compass. So the statute 30 VSA requires that the plan shall be for 10 years and quote, shall serve as a basis for state telecommunications policy. What forum does that occur in? In state contracts? No. State agency plans? No. Act 250 or Act 248? No. Section 248, not Act 250. Section 248A, tower siding, no. The only place, where does the rubber meet the road? 30 VSA 226A, which is contract regulation, and 226B, which is incentive regulation. And a brief history of those is, is warranted here because in, 90, in 1989, the first contract regulation was initiated and it was initially rejected by the PSB. They modified it and approved it for three years. In 1991, they filed this VTA 2, the Vermont Telecommunications Agreement number two. In the meantime, the statute that had authorized contract regulation had required that the first telecom plan be created and adopted by January 1 of 89. Lo and behold, it was ignored. It, in 91, here's VTA 2 sitting on the table, and we noticed, uh, Lauren Glenn and I were both involved in that, at that era, we noticed that where's the plan it's supposed to be found consistent with? And the plan wasn't there. We learned later that there was a draft plan that hadn't been released to the public, and I'm gonna to have to, in order to, I'm gonna to have to keep this uh, focused here. So this came out of a summer study in 86, which was Senators Phil Hoff, Harvey Carter, and George Little. You way before our time. Okay, and <laughs> Representative Lawrence Chase, Richard Hausman, and John Kennedy. John Kennedy, is this right, Nettie So, Act 87, they finished their report in 86, their summer study in 86. They filed their report in January of 87. Act 87 of 87, back where they had that kind of yeah. flexibility, uh, created the contract, authorized the first contract regulation and required the first telecom plan. And allowed the first contract to go into effect in the absence of a plan because it would take a few years to write it. But they did require that the first telecom plan be completed by January of 89. The department ignored it. I recently talked to George Sturzinger, and he says, what were they gonna do, put us in planning jail? <laughs> uh, they, they were under resource. Uh, yeah, but that's another issue. The, the purpose of that bill was to strengthen the state's role in telecommunications planning. And so here we are 30 years later, and we have not strengthened the state's role in telecommunications planning, and billions upon billions of infrastructure have been built out. There's a statutory goal or policy in 202C for open access, and yet no one has ever written any rules for what that means. So everybody's building repeat and redundant fiber rather than using the abundant fiber that's already there in one sheath. Similar with towers. Northfield, a second tower just appeared on the hill. So, so the, as soon as the plan was adopted, no, the, the legislature got involved. R Riley Allen let it skip, slip in a con lunchtime conversation that Louise McCarran, who had been commissioner of public service, was voluntarily rewriting the draft plan after Snelling had died and after she had left office. So it's like, what? And she was rewriting this plan. Let's, let's do it today. Okay. Well, my point is that the, the industry, the industry corrupting the planning process. It has not been, yes. 
And so the legislature formed a joint committee and they studied over the summer. They held hearings around the state. And that's why I'm telling you this is this is what's needed now. Okay. A summer study that dives into updating the requirements of the plan and considering the needs in a current environment. Okay, so what I'm getting is we need a summer study to talk about today's situation and what needs to be in an updated plan. And we need an engineering-based I would argue that you should put out the, the immediate, put out a contract for a plan now and have the summer study and the well, legislation. I, I, I have this one problem. Okay. Money. I have to get it from over there, which means I need to find out what it costs. I would ask you to have your attorney look at 30 BSA 20 and 21, which is the language authorizing the bill back. These are regulated utilities, and I would argue that if, if the PUC opens an investigation related to this, the bill back authority is triggered. Okay. The governor still has veto authority over that. But okay. my point is that th these are legitimate things to build back to the utilities. Well, some of these are regulated utilities, but much of what we're talking about are unregulated. Those who are providers of internet, those who are providers of broadband. I'm st what I'm talking about is that we need, we're talking about regulated infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The services provided over, mm -hmm. the wireless right. and the, that, mm -hmm. we don't need. Well, by regulated infrastructure, do you mean anything that is built under Act 248, you're adding to that list of what is regulated infrastructure, as opposed to conventional telephone companies, for example? I'm, I'm, no, I'm saying that the regulated, the fiber that and the towers that are owned by these are still regulated, certificated companies in Vermont, and they, they can have permit conditions on their tower permits that you will have redundant fiber connections from your tower. There's a lot of latitude that we do have on the infrastructure basis without getting into the we'll, we'll get Not regulated rates. We'll get yeah, your questions questions have to be answered. Okay. Your questions I'm going to try and wrap this up because I've got one more witness to get in, and I do want to give a break because okay. getting oxygen back in this room is helpful. I will, I will wrap up with a disturbing list of what's missing from the plan. Or I would say that the, how can this plan possibly be found to be? Uh, Give us a list. Steve. Okay. How does the Department of Public Service, charged under 202D as being the responsible planning agency of the state? reconcile the department's failure to plan for and integrate each of the following initiatives into this draft plan. The enhanced 911 system, service reliability, resiliency. The post remote vulnerability, which I've recently discovered. The vulnerability to the Sovernet cracked fiber, which interrupted 911 calls. It was never investigated. The voice over IP, the power amplifiers on the poles lose power and People cannot call 911 from a VoIP phone, which most people on Comcast Network have migrated to. The first net, AT&T rollout of 29 new towers and the high power spectrum. Hardening of the tire towers and fiber backhaul to withstand hurricane force winds. The siting of the 400 VTA financed microcells that we, the state owns that are still sitting in boxes. The fundamental importance of the neutral host infrastructure model. Rural areas will never be profitable for multiple carriers. In the neutral host model, where the infrastructure is paid for by incremental payments from all the carriers using it. And that also solves the problem that you, you raised, Madam Chair, of needing two phones to get from here to Cabot. Mm -hmm. The neutral host model, the small cells that are owned by the state, pick up all the carriers, U.S. Cellular, Sprint, Verizon, right? That is fundamental for most of rural Vermont. The only places where you're going to- Go back to coverage code. Not coverage code, but the microcells but neutral simple. host model, right? The state-owned microwave network, which is upgrade plans to increase capacity, currently managed by public safety, even though statute requires that DII manage all the state networks. 
the comprehensive propagation mapping. The LMR radio is missing from the plan. The health and safety assessment of the RF wireless, especially as you get to higher frequencies of 5G. The Natural Resources Board, statutory wireless facilities inventory is required under 10 VSA 6030. It's been ignored for years. They're required to have an inventory of all wireless facilities, and no one's doing it, and no one's holding the them to it. Resources board? Yes, Be on the theory that Act 250 permits for towers. Wow. And then when you adopted Section 248A, no one required that they okay. provide that now, information to the Natural Resources Board. Uh, Preemption efforts to supersede municipal zoning and siting of small cells in 5G. That's, I believe, what's hidden in this 20 year Microsoft contract. The middle mile dark fiber, fiber access points, location planning integration. So the state's investing hundreds of thousands in putting new fiber access points, splice cans, on the state owned fiber up in the Northeast Kingdom. But there's no coordination with whether we would need a microcell there. So when we needed to put a coverage co microcell, they had to build a mile or two back to get to an access point. Gross waste of money. Okay. So this is integrated planning, and I could. Okay, I think I think you've given us enough to work. I think on. you understand. So. No, I don't think we understand. No. <laughs> it's a big problem. Uh, the secrecy of the in infrastructure, there is, Charlie Larkin and I hired a company called Vantage Point to do an assessment of state telecommunications yeah. in, uh, four years ago. Then we asked them to do an engineering assessment of the 2014 plan. And they wrote a letter, which I'll give you copies of, which says we can't do it because everything's under these secrecy okay. clauses. And it's probably national security. No, it's not national security. It's, not it's national security. in fact I have fifty eighty-three non-disclosure agreements signed by VTA and every carrier and their brother. But the point is that they what they do is they undermine public records law by saying we're gonna presume Somebody has a, a privacy trade secret interest in this, and we're going to make you take us all the way to court before we're going to give you a public record. Okay. So I apologize for. No, this the, has been helpful. No, it back up. It's just going to take us a little while to digest it all on all yeah. fronts. Now we're just getting started. Of what? Okay, I'm going to try and get Jeremy in. Jeremy, can you do this in 10 minutes? Yep. And then we'll do a 15 minute break. Uh, we can run a little long. I think I've got a meeting at 4.30, not yours. Another one got put in there. Um, but we'll uh, try and get this all out. Okay. I didn't mean to take Lauren Glenn's. Oh no, Lauren Glenn's off. I'm okay. sticking Dave, uh, Jeremy in. Um, everybody else we're gonna keep on schedule try and get everybody out of here. Okay. So I think it's kind of to print paper copies of these out too, but I think, did, did you put them in there? I they're did. online? They're online, but hand out, they like paper. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay. If you haven't done this before, just name yeah. them. Uh, I'm, I'm Jeremy Hansen, uh, I live in Berlin. Um, I'm a computer science professor at Norwich University. Um, I'm also a Berlin Select Board member. Uh, I teach computer networking, security, and other stuff like that. Um, so I'm kind of coming at this problem from both a municipal official and as a tech geek. Um, I founded and I chair the uh, Communications Union District's um, CB Fiber. Uh, we cover 16 towns in Washington <coughs> County, Lamoille County, and Orange County. Um, we are probably going to add our 17th Woodbury um, in the next two weeks, actually. Um, so I'm here as uh, as a representative from CB Fiber to, and to talk as a chair. I'm not authorized by the board or anything to, to take, um, to make statements on their behalf when I'm speaking as the chair. Um, so uh, first of all, and you'll, you'll see this in my testimony here, I'd like to thank Clay for what they have put out. Um, there's a lot of work in telecommunications po policy as you've probably figured out by some of the past testimony. This is really large and really all-encompassing. Um, any report that's produced will necessarily have gaps. 
there's not really not really a way around it. So it was a heavy lift, and while there are some places that I think there, there could be some improvement, in, including concrete policy proposals, I think what was provided gives a pretty good, a pretty good picture of where we are at the moment. Um, I'm going to try to be as narrow as possible and talk only about communications union districts and how I, I think that um, the communications union district model is the right way to get Vermont moving forward to actually hitting um, maybe not the, the timeline of getting everybody 100 megabit per second internet access, but at least getting that sooner or, or making that actually possible. Um, so um, I want to point out I support the, what's in the plan, the conclusions about le legislative cha changes to the public records law, the thing about municipal bonding that, that Clay mentioned earlier, and David Healy, who is on the CV Fiber board, who is set to testify shortly. Um, he's going to talk more about maps and data and echo some of uh, Mr. Whitaker's comments before. Um, he has some, some good maps as a, as a map guy and a data guy that I think will hopefully um, give you a sense of where these community efforts like CV Fiber um, where those are currently. Um, so I'm looking, you know, 10 years down the road, and I'm, I'm envisioning a network of these communications union districts covering basically all of Vermont. I really think that that's going to be our best way forward to get, to actually get real 21st century broadband to <coughs> folks in Vermont. Um, and in fact, there is some, um, some folks working on essentially creating resource kits, uh, documents, and essentially, um, cheat sheets for other folks in other places in Vermont who want to create communications union districts of their own. And I know there's um, probably at least two, maybe three, um, kind of behind the scenes communications union districts being sort of worked on. They're in the early stages right now. Like the fire districts in the future. Yes, exactly. <coughs> Internet districts. Um, so uh, because we're a municipality, we anticipate um, taking out revenue bonds. I think Clay mentioned that before. And those are, would cover our infrastructure costs. Um, I'm, you know, in founding CB Fiber, I really looked at EC Fiber uh, as an as an inspiration. Um, however, using going and getting those revenue bonds requires audited financials for a certain number of years, and that's a hard chicken and egg sort of thing to get to, where we have, you know, reasonable revenues and we can stay in business. We have something to show in order to get to that point. Um, I wanted to sort of take a quick a quick segue um, to a, a, a previous comment that was made about uh, EC Fiber being in a unique situation. I, I don't think that's the case at all. Our towns are not all that different. Um, you know, the business model for Barry City and Montpelier would, is rather different than it is for some of the Orange, Orange County towns that we have, for example, Williamstown and Orange. Um, the densities are quite similar. Um, the costs are quite similar. And I can, I can say with confidence that the EC Fiber model can work in other places because um, up in Craftsbury, Kingdom Fiber turned on customers in, in Craftsbury within the last six months, giving them gigabit fiber to the premises. Um, the gentleman who's spearheading that effort is also on the CV Fiber board and is helping us try um, to make that, that successful. Michael Birnbaum, which I think he will be here on Thursday. I don't know, maybe not in this committee, but he will be in this building on Thursday. Um, uh, EC Fiber, just to go back to that, EC Fiber was building primarily in places that had DSL, so where there were phone lines, where there was existing copper, they overbuilt that. They get a 30 to 35 percent take rate. So of the, in those places where there's DSL, 30 to 35 percent of residences said, hey, yes, we actually want fiber to the premises. In, in places where they built where there was already cable, that take rate is 17%. And there's a bit of fluctuation based on town and based, um, based on when they built it. Um, but they have good concrete data that shows that this, this model is, um, is definitely something to be emulated and something that we can, um, we can use here in central Vermont moving forward. Um, so, I want to, want to back up a little bit and talk about um, a couple of different ways that I, th I think the legislature can get involved in the, in the funding of this. You can sort of talk, ask yourselves about priorities. Um, the connectivity initiative, like Clay mentioned, is really about getting the last few people that don't have anything. And it's really focused, it's really focused on that, and that's a, that's a laudable goal, no, no doubt about it. Um, it's solving a different problem than what people generally talk about we talk about improving broadband in Vermont. 
We want to improve broadband and get real high-speed internet access, something like Burlington Telecom, like Senator Pearson might be able to experience at his house, but very few of us anywhere else in the state can, can experience. Um, these are, these are two, two different problems, and I think we probably need to, to come at them at, at the same time. So that connectivity fund, I think, was, as was mentioned before, this is a really, really expensive proposition. So even though there's another million dollars being put into the connectivity fund, we're still we're, we're talking about handfuls of subscribers that are getting additional access to, for it, DSL in a lot of cases and cable in uh, in other cases. EC Fiber will take advantage of that and bring some people true 21st century fiber to the premises. Um, and then there's another half a million dollars in the governor's budget proposal for loan guarantees. I'm, I'm not sure that that's really appropriate for what we're doing at the moment. I don't think we're ready to take advantage of something like that. Um, I, I, I did hear, and I, and I don't know, um, uh, I don't know details. There was a discussion of creating a $12 million revolving loan fund for the use of communications union district districts to be that bridge funding to get us from 2019 to. 2022, 2023, when we can go to the municipal bond market and say, hey, we, this is something we want to participate in, then we take that bond money and we pay it back to the state, and then the state can invest in the next, in the next com com communications union district that wants to use it to build out wherever. So this is, um, if that is in fact something that is, that is in the pipeline, that's in the works, I, I really think that, that that would be an, an amazing opportunity and is a clear, concrete, substantive move forward. And that's all I got for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. For Mr. Healy in our folders. Okay, welcome. Thank you. My name is David Healy, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify on this proposed plan. Um, just some background, I want to correct the, uh, the warning for this meeting. I am not affiliated with Stone Environmental on the comments I'm talking about, just to okay. be clear. Uh -huh. I'll, because I'll I don't, do it from the webpage. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm representing myself as a citizen of the town of Callis and the okay. Callis representative to the CB5 board. I am not speaking on the part of the CB5 board, but I'm on the board. And what I'm going to discuss is stuff that I have learned as I've tried to um, become a user of data to help the CD Fiber Board develop and deploy fiber. Um, my background is this GIS. I've spent the last 30 years plus doing geographic information systems work, both data collection as well as application development. And I'm going to probably so you do do GIS. I do do GIS. I've been doing it forever. I was hoping you could tell us how much money I've got to go big for to get engineering stuff. <laughs> Uh, there's some numbers in my testimony on that. I, it, it's, I mean, for the data that I'm talking about. But anyway, let me, the reason I'm here is to gain recognition for the need to provide direction and funding for the development of a statewide telecommunications infrastructure database. Now, when the state's GIS started in 1988, I was the operations administrator, and we developed a plan about what the priority, high priority data sets were, and utilities were in there. The funding was cut in 1992, it was funded by the property transfer tax, and so funding of data from that fund stopped at that point. Um, I'm advocating that this infrastructure database get created again as a, a statewide um, thing to support um, communication union district deployment and planning of uh, fiber. Um, and it, basically it's impossible to plan without good data. And I think you saw that in the plan itself. We're looking at historically at backwards data. We need to look forward. And the department has spent a lot of time compiling data on their broadband initiatives. They have a lot of data by you know census block and and that you know what the deployment is. But to go forward with actually building a system, you need a lot more data. And that's what I'm sort of advocating in my testimony. Um, it's not an easy task to do statewide. E911 was started in 1993, I believe, and it took a few years to get, we have some of the best data in the United States on that. And that data set, which cost millions of dollars, was, is, has been reused for lots of other purposes besides E911. And I can tell you from the environmental side of things, we've used it from everything from on-site wastewater management studies just to know where a building is 
so you can do peripheral spatial analysis around that data. Um, I think the lacking of the you know the, the data structure, uh, data information for poles, insular facilities related to poles that are next to it, or what's on the poles, is all critical to to building the system. And it, one of the things that in listening to some of the the stories from EC Fiber and, and Kingdom Fiber is that everybody's in these communications uni union districts is collecting data. Is it being done consistently with a with set of standards? No, they're doing it at the level they need to do to run and operate the fiber but deployment. This is information that the state could use in multiple, multiple ways. areas. Yes. So, and so arguably, I, maybe we should. Correct. And, and that's the way the state's GIS system was built. We build yeah. standards, and then we build it to that standard. Even if you go out and do it yourself, there's a standard to follow. So, for example, <coughs> property mapping. Property mapping standards were developed in the early 90s. And now they're universally accepted by towns and this new statewide property map that'll be finished next year with attached to the grand list is another one of those resources, in this case funded by VTrans with both federal and state money, is another as asset to this statewide information system. And the utility infrastructure is the, the big one piece that's missing. So the question for me is, where do we go to find this? Is there a central, there is a central GIS clearinghouse. Right. The state's, the Vermont Center for Geographic Information, which is now housed in the agency of digital services. Yes. They, are, they are storing and, and managing multiple data sets that are accessible over the web, if you have web, if you have internet access. Um, they are in a position of not only overseeing and working with the department, uh, public service have developed the standard for the kind of information that's needed for the deployment of fiber to the premises. Um, I don't believe it would take that long to create those standards because there's a lot of other organizations in the United States that have already done this and some of the software companies out there have already built the data model to hold and contain this information and the question about how do you collect it and who collects it may not need to be that a big an issue, but there needs to be one repository that the information goes into. Um, the other data set, and you know, it was also described here, is, is where is cellular towers, what's the, what's the propagation? And that building that comprehensive data set is, and keeping it current is important as well. And so I'm looking at it, teleco infrastructure is a broad definition. And if it's only built at a piece at a time, that's okay. I just want to make sure that it's done in a, in a sort of a comprehensive way that's useful for everybody. Um, and what's happened in, is I was working to develop the information for CB Fiber. Um, I put out requests for acquiring data. I could get the data from VCGI easily for Green Mountain Powers, Poles, and Lines. They have, and I put this in my testimony. They have, okay data, um, there's not a lot of information about what's on their poles, it just tells you who owns them, how tall they are, and <coughs> some information about electric um, wire transmission on them. We're talking about a lot more information that's needed about every pole. Um, to do this, you know, the range of costs for collecting information per pole is in the range of, you know, 20 to $40 per pole. So it's not, a, that even that is not a cheap undertaking. But without it, you're really stuck. I mean, right now, CV Fiber, I mean, uh, EC Fiber and Kingdom Fiber are out there GPSing poles, even though the data exists in these other electronic databases, because they're not accurate enough. And so to be able to run a span between poles, you need to know pretty accurately what the distance is. So it's being recollected. Is it being shared back with the electric utilities? Don't know, but I my guess it isn't. It isn't. Um, uh, so that's another area that I think you know needs to be addressed in some sort of statute or you know mandate that comes out of this. Um, so public access is another critical thing. And is I did make public information requests to Hybrid Electric and Marsville Municipal Electric, and uh, one other I couldn't get any data from them. When I contacted Velco, Velco said we might be able to give you our fiber distribution lines with a non-disclosure agreement. And I, they, and I basically said, well, at this point, I don't need, I mean, I'd like to have your data, but I don't need it until we start doing our engineering studies. But that's the kind of thing that people are spending a lot of time trying to find. 
So setting the record straight on how this information is managed, collected, and used um, is something that's going to take a little bit of time, but I believe needs to be done if we're really going to succeed at deploying fiber to the premise around the state of Vermont. Um, the other thing I found out in, in, in researching this topic is that even there are, there are pole attachment fees that are regulated by the Public Utilities Commission, well, uh, Washington Electric is not sure who's on what pole, and so they're missing an opportunity of collecting fees. So the, the idea of this, there could be recovery here for the utilities as well, and so that address that doesn't get to how do we pay for this? How do things get attached to a pole, and no one has a record of what's attached to the pole? Well, there's probably a paper, paper record that has been automated into a billing oh, system. So somewhere in a file, there's yeah. a paper thing. Sure, because it has to go through the process of getting attachments. Yeah, I thought, so. yeah, you didn't just go out and put no. something on a pole. Although you might find that some places. <laughs> um, they could make a very lethal mistake right. doing that. So anyway, that, that's sort of my, um, I think it's a collaborative effort between the department, the utilities, and VCGI uh, to make this happen. The time frame for doing it, I guess I would say as soon as the standards were done, all the communication union districts that are deploying and going forward with this would probably be the high priority areas for collecting the data because this isn't going to be done overnight. Um, and then following that, I would suggest that we actually refine the public access components of this and really define what's publicly accessible and available for use in both the public, the communication union districts, um, and um, and the utilities. Um, I, in, the for, in the course of trying to get Washington Electric's pole and wiring data, I was told that I, they didn't want to give it to me because it was, they just didn't want to give it to me. And I said, is that a, is that a reason? And I said, Green Mountain Power has been giving its data out for five years, 10 years. They, every year they update their database with the Vermont Center of Geographic Information, and I, I can download it, I can look at it on the web, I can look at it anyway. And after five months of badgering them, they finally agreed to put their data up on the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. But that's a lot of work. Yeah, my it took five months. Yeah. Thank you, though. <laughs> but, um, and I think that, you know, it's not that they have ill will about what they have, it's just they don't know how to do it, and, uh, and they don't have resources to do it. So it's not, I don't want to disparage anybody in this testimony I'm giving it, it's just a lot of work. Yeah. And that I think the legislature can help make this a lot simpler. <coughs> So that, that's my testimony is a lot more detailed, um, and I'll leave it at that. And if there's any questions, I did include a map in my testimony of where the fiber districts are in Vermont. Um, there's 65 towns currently doing this. On the um, I left out two towns on this map that were doing. They're called ready districts, rural and economic development initiatives. Is that what they call? Them? And that's Corinth and um, and Newbury. And they're available, with, why they took that route is there's some rural development <coughs> money that's available for this. And in the farm bill, just to let you know about other financing possibilities, the farm bill that just passed has a lot of money for rural uh, broadband. Um, they also have money in the bill. The, uh, there's the Northern Borderlands Commission. And they have gotten, they're getting $33 million a year beginning this year from the farm bill. And this year, all Vermont counties are eligible to ap apply for that money. Kingdom Fiber received some of that money last year, and that's how they're putting the infrastructure in Craftsbury and Greensboro. Um, so there's a lot of other opportunities for, but it's, yeah, it's a mishmash. Those strike me as the towns that are resource poor. Correct. Well, they have people who want that, <laughs> but I would hope that we might use federal money to go where there isn't much personal or municipal money. money. And that's where the, the backbone stuff comes in. And I, I don't want to talk at this point, but the movement of rural electric co-ops into um, fiber is something that's been going on nationally. Washington Electric is thinking about it. And what they're thinking would be they might consider putting fiber in, in all their network, but they don't want to operate uh, a fiber system. They will just let people, other people use it. But there's, and they have access to money as well, but they need to find the business case to do it. So it's a lot of, I, I'm optimistic about Vermont, but it's certainly going to take, you know, 
consolidate efforts to make it happen. Go ahead. Right. Are, are there uh, strategies that, you know, we're hearing that some of the federal money is going to extend copper, for instance, which is really galling. Are there state strategies that can, I don't know, prohibit, but, but help avoid that sort of foolish investment? I guess if, if the plan, the telecommunications plan said they weren't going to do that or, or it's in statute already, then we shouldn't be spending any of that money even though it's allocated for that purpose or could be allocated for that purpose should we be doing it. Um, so yeah, no, I, it seems a little crazy. I, I, I think I'm, I'm so encouraged by community initiative to make this happen. So, And I, in, in terms of looking at like the CV fiber, I've done the numbers on how many houses there are per road per mile, and I can use that in the 911 database. I said, how many roads are on this road segment? Um, and you know, for the most part, we have six houses per mile, which is the minimum they really want to do fiber at home. But you know, EC fiber has been running it everywhere anyway, and hoping that the other people kept, catch up with it. But if you amortize the cost of the town of Calus, would cost about three million dollars to run fiber to get to every house. If you put that over a 20-year basis, $3 million is probably not all that lot, especially if it's you know, revenue generated you know, to pay it back. So I, I, you know, I think we probably just haven't been thinking quite well over the last couple decades. Good. We're going to try and get it back on track. OK. I keep seeing that camera and think I'm seeing a hand raised over there. Just catch it in the corner of my eye. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Thank you uh, very much. What's the name of your organization? Central Vermont Fiber. 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 Central Vermont Fiber. Sorry. Um, anytime anybody go and says something about something C Fiber, they always think it's EC Fiber. Yeah, it's Central Vermont Fiber. So is CB. How, you know, any suggestions to, I mean, this is a new fiber network which is copying. Easy. Uh, I don't want to call which it. Which is on the VC fiber. VC fiber is East Central Vermont well, I fiber. Just, is, there, <coughs> is that what it means? Is there a way to uh, rename or come up with a well, new name website, or something so everybody knows the difference the when you hear it? The website is Central Vermont Fiber. Okay. Did you have a hand up? Yes. It's yes, in it's your folder. folder. <laughs> it's in your folder. <coughs> Should be behind okay. the plan. Other questions? Thank you. Thank this you. becomes slightly less muddy the further we go. This was helpful. So, Chair, I suggest the enthusiastic and renewed interest in these issues. I think there is. It's been a few What could years. possibly happen? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going now to Lauren Glenn Davidian. Kevin Christopher. So we may actually ahead of schedule. So if there's anybody else that would like to, to speak um, at the end, we can fit you in. Okay. Okay, you're together. We're together. Okay. We, that way we don't have to pipe up on each other from the sidelines. Okay. So I'm Lauren Glendavidian. I'm the Executive Director of CCTV Center for Media and Democracy based in Burlington, Vermont. We started public access television, public educational and government, that's PEG, known as PEG, in 1983. Um, so I go back maybe longer than Sean Kennedy, I'm not sure. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm Kevin Christopher. I'm the executive director of Lake Champlain Access TV. We're the same facility for a different area. We're based in Colchester. I'm also the president of the Vermont Access Network, which is our statewide support and advocacy organization, um, which represents all 25 access centers throughout Vermont. Okay, this is Orca locally. Orca yes. in Montpelier. Yeah. Okay. Orca in Montpelier. Orca in Montpelier. Exactly. Um, so we thought that we would use this opportunity of the 10-year telecommunications plan being presented to you as a way to highlight the issues that um, two fundamental issues that are before the state and that we would like to seek your advice here at this table um, about how to proceed. We have some thoughts and we want to run them by you. Um, there are two fundamental issues that face the state faces today in our opinion. Um, the first is the erosion of the state's authority to manage its public rights of way. <coughs> 
Um, and a symptom of that is uh, declining funding for public educational and government <coughs> access TV channels, which are required by the state of cable operators who choose to use the public rights of way to provide cable TV. They use those same rights of way to provide internet service, but they're not regulated in the same way by the state. The, um, the issue of the state's ability to manage its rights of way, I think, is the fundamental question. And it is the foundation upon which the state decided that public access, which I will call for, to make it short, public access television was a public benefit. Um, the state decided this in 1984. This was even before the Cable Communications Act of 1984 was passed. So the state decided to do this absent federal requirement. And um, the state said, basically, we will achieve this public policy objective of having local communications systems develop around our state through our regulatory structure. Um, there are four or five uh, actions currently at play that are both federal, state, and uh, judicial that I, we wanted to bring to your attention that um, calls the state's ability to carry out this public policy objective into question. And so we are concerned about, A, does the state still believe this is an important public policy objective? And in the face of the eroding regulatory authority to get this done, um, what other options are there for us as a state? But I just want to reiterate that this goes back to this more fundamental question of the state's authority over its rights of way. So um, there are four or five, as I said, um, things happening that are threatening public access funding. And I think most of you have appeared on your local channels so that you know that there are government access channels that post election forms and cover <coughs> meetings. There are educational access channels that provide educational resources all across the state and supplement our education system for people of all ages. And there are public access channels, which really are a true free speech forum that you will not find in any other venue. Um, maybe you will. But um, when you started, you wouldn't. Um, but these are really the places and the channels where we can engage in discussion with people who think differently from us, which is actually fundamentally the only way democracy can work. So for many reasons um, that we don't need to, to go into deeply because I think you understand them, um, these public educational and government access channels are really central to our ability as a state to function well, to build community, and to um, come up with the best possible ideas about how to go forward. So the first thing is that there is cable cord cutting. So people are finding it much more convenient and less expensive to cancel their cable subscription because the video entertainment to which they are accustomed is now available on the internet in an a la carte way. So you can buy HBO on Amazon if you want to. You don't have to have cable TV to watch the next season of True Detective. So why pay $100 um, a month for cable if all you really want is HBO? So because, um, just to clarify, um, the state requires the cable companies to um, pass on, to, to um, well, let me just back up. So the state of Vermont, when a cable company wants a franchise or a certificate of public good from the state of Vermont, the state sets a series of conditions. And one of those conditions is that public access channels will be set aside and 5.5% of funding on every bill will be put and passed on to subscribers. So public access channels are funded not by the cable operator, but by subscribers. Cable operators don't really like this fee because it makes it hard for them to compete with satellite providers that don't have this fee because um, satellite is regulated federally, not on a state level. And now it makes it hard for them to compete <laughs> with themselves, their internet business. So they'd like everybody to be moving to the internet because it's much cheaper for them to operate. So cable cord cutting, for a variety of reasons, is having an impact. The fewer cable subscribers there are, the fewer, the smaller amount of money <coughs> access television. 
So what we're seeing is a trend line that has plateaued in terms of cable revenue and is starting to go down like this. So this is something we've known since 1990 when the phone companies first got into the telecom business. This is not a new thing. It's just we're now finally seeing. So we've been thinking about this since how many years is that? 28. <laughs> Keep trying to re-add the numbers. It's always the same. Um, the second thing that's happening is that um, Comcast uh, is suing the state in federal court because when the Public Utility Commission um, said, uh, put conditions on its certificate of public good last year, its renewal, its 11 year renewal, they put a number of conditions and one of them, for example, was that Comcast would need to invest three million or more dollars into the electronic program guides so that public access TV channels could be found and the programs could be um, manipulated, seen, stored, saved, to be seen. So right now, if we put Burlington City Council on the Channel 17 line on the program guide in Burlington, it will show up in Richmond. And this is a vestige of the 80s when there were five <coughs> cable companies in the state before Adelphia bought everybody up, and then Comcast bought Adelphia and consolidated these systems. They didn't rewire their head ends. So there's some real legacy architecture that does not serve people who are looking for their Burlington City Council meeting at a particular time. They can't find it on the program guide, and that's true all across the state. I have a question. Just, just to be clear, folks in Richmond are not watching the Burlington exactly. Telecom. It's, it's just a labeling, is that what you mean? It's the, it's the program guide is regional, not town by town. It's so, inaccurate when people in Richmond read it? Is that what you're saying? No, it's that if we were to put it on, if we were to pay the program guide service to put Burlington City Council on Channel 17 in Burlington, it would sh also show up in ri Richmond because the way the programming guide service is designed is regional. So but, you do but the show wouldn't be. No. No. Right. But just you can't. So, but if you can't find a program on the program guide, it does, you don't exist in the mind of a cable viewer. Hmm. You can't record the program, you can't do it, save it to be seen another time. It, it ghettoizes as essentially. But is Burlington shown on there? Well, we don't list it because if we did, it would screw up Richmond. Mm -hmm. So you just say cable access or something? It says cable, government access. Yeah. Yep. So Comcast was not happy. What is it? Do you see what it says? In the <coughs> it's the government access programming. That's what it says, I think, for Orca. Yeah, yeah. so this is true across the, the state. The, 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 I have to look and see and if I recognize on. faces to figure the out local. if it's Barry, Montpelier, or Waterbury I'm looking at. Okay. Precisely. So, 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 so Comcast, I I'm sorry. Yeah. Just try to help. Folks that are saying, because you and I were talking about this, yeah. took me a minute. Okay. So, if you live in Richmond, whatever the Richmond access is filming is shown at 7 o'clock. And you live in Burlington, whatever or Glenn's shop is showing is being shown at 7 o'clock. And on your guide, it says government access. But if they wanted to have more detail and say Burlington City Council, they're putting that in would change all around the region, it would say Burlington Cable Access or Burlington City Council, even though in Richmond you'd be watching the Richmond Select Board or whatever. So, so that's you where the only have is. one government access program so on that. Only, no, so only the no, label no, in the guide. Only the only label in the guide. You can have as many. Yeah, 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 and your big you TV screen would say local okay. news. Right. Yeah. So Comcast told the Public Utility Commission it would cost $3 million to fix this problem. And the Public Utility Commission looked at the evidence and they said, well, you made a net profit of $57 million in 2015. So we think actually you could afford to solve this problem and we require this as a condition of your contract renewal to fix this problem. So this is one of a few things that Comcast said, well, we're not, we don't like that because we don't want to be told what to do by the regulatory authority, 
even though they have agreed to fix these problems or to provide high definition access channels all across the country in side agreements. So Comcast went to federal court. So currently Judge Crawford in the Rutland Federal Court is overseeing this case, <coughs> which um, just to say, it cost the Vermont Access Network members $150,000 in legal fees to participate in the Certificate of Public Good process. And we're anticipating it will cost another $150,000 to be involved in this case to make sure that what the state has required Comcast to do, Comcast will have to do. So that's the second kind of threat that we're dealing with, which is we are spending subscriber dollars defending legal positions that it, of course, we understand why Comcast would go to the mat, but doesn't seem to be the best use of um, anybody's time. Anybody's money. time, and it, it is a it is an it is an affront to the state's authority to require these things that they're asking legitimately within Rule Eight, which is the rule that controls cable TV, and within the Cable Communications Act of 1984, which is the federal controlling document of all of these things. The third thing is the FCC. So in the Cable Act of 1984, there are really two public interest baskets. One is the state's or municipality's authority, in this case of Vermont, it's the state's authority to require a franchise fee to be used for public purposes or public access. And the other is another basket, which is that the state could say, you need to put in a public, uh, a drop so we can go live from the Rutland City Hall or you have to provide discounted cable service for low-income people. Or um, in the case of Burlington, Burlington requires an additional franchise fee on top of what is collected for public access. And the FCC has even said, we think, cable company, that you should be able to take the cost of the channel, the public access channel, and subtract that from the franchise fee dollars. So the FCC is proposing that all the stuff in basket two it gets subtracted from the revenue that the access channels use to run their access channels. So this is a rulemaking that the FCC is now considering. They've taken how many comments? Uh, a few thousand. A few thousand, 250 from Vermont, good showing. Um, but they are likely to um, rule on this and basically to rule that cable operators could do things like subtract the value of a channel from the dollars that are given to access, which will be devastating to access. It will close down access centers, we think. Um, and we know that there will be a court challenge once the FCC rules this, because this is, of course, how telecommunication policy works. Congress does something, the FCC interprets the court's challenge, I mean, it's this. Yeah, we're virtuous. still working our way through net neutrality. Exactly. It's a virtuous cycle, but whether that FCC decision is stayed while the court case goes on, is we don't know. So this is okay. So that's the third threat. Once you're not, out of business, it doesn't make much difference, does right. it? Right. And you know, Comcast would have discretion as to whether they would take the cost of a channel and subtract it under the franchise fee. They don't they won't be required to do that. Um, but we already have a letter from Dan Glanville from Comcast asking him about HD channels, and he said, well, of course, the cost of HD channels, which we don't have high definition for access in Vermont, except on Burlington Telecom, could be subtracted from your franchise fee, which indicates they're already considering that. And they have provided testimony about the value of these channels, whether they're market value or, like, I, I don't know how they're going to price it. Is what's really going on that they've got a limited number of bandwidth or channels and they think maybe they could sell yours to something more profitable? You know what's so interesting about that is that when we started, there were three channels on 36, three access channels on 36 channels. So we had, what's that, 10% you know, and 9%. Um, our share of the bandwidth has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk because, in fact, they don't use channels to deliver to deliver content. They serve it up from a computer. So it's not even like there are dedicated public access channels anymore on which our programming sits and is real estate occupied by the public, 
which was the initial concept behind it. It's no longer constructed that way. They use the same network that they used to deliver internet service, just to say, same network, and they serve up content like a program. Like they, it's not like the stream that's mm -hmm. open to the public okay, the whole time. Like, yeah. yeah, this was the explanation of digital. Yeah. So final, the final just threat, and I just, I, I don't, I don't mean to sound like a whiner, but it's just important that you understand yeah. that there's this like federal judicial and also the discretion of the cable operator is the, or in addition to cable cord cutting, that threatens these, this community ecosystem of information. And it wouldn't help you if a fair number of Vermonters threatened to cut their cable cord if well, not Comcast under the was not a good behavior. Not under the current way that we fund her access. So, um, so we'll, just, we'll get to that point in one second. So the, the final thing is that in um, January of this past year, 2018, Comcast was given advice by their auditors, GAP advice, generally accepted accounting principles advice, that they could reclassify what they count as revenue. And um, they did. And that resulted in a $500,000 loss of income for the access channels around the state. And they had discretion, because they're the only cable operator in Vermont that has done this. Who stayed there? Comcast. Okay. Yeah. So that just, I think, reinforces the concern we have about the FCC rulemaking. And, um, and fundamentally, the question of how do we advance this public policy objective if the regulatory arena is being threatened in these ways and we can no longer achieve the objective of creating these community media centers that support the um, well-being and the common good of Vermont. So I'm going to let Kevin Sick get a word in. Um, and then we have a couple of recommendations that we just would like your feedback on. Uh, well, my colleague says it so eloquently. I, I think the one thing I would add is that I don't know about your towns, but in the towns that I serve and live in, we've seen such um, a shrinkage of local content in our local uh, print and television uh, other than access media that in many towns in Vermont, we are the last refuge of, of local content, of connection to uh, town government, city government, connection to schools, <coughs> libraries. Uh, that's disappearing at a alarming rate in other avenues, and um, we're hopeful that we can maintain that in our industry here in Vermont and around the country. So were there any questions on what I said so far? Mark? Yeah. Why are they doing this? Why is, why is Comcast doing this? Will they, will they try to make a greater profit with that time or with customers? I mean, I think that they have a prime directive, which is their margin, which is profit. I mean, you know, they're a business. They're, they're, not, they're not here to make the community a better place. They're here to deliver to their shareholders. So I think they're going to be very <coughs> aggressive in their um, public policy agenda. And um, they see access, despite what they may say, we think access is a good thing, they see it as a competitive disadvantage. I mean, that's been our experience. Who has the advantage over them? Well, in the, in the old days, um, it was satellite. So they saw themselves, Comcast saw themselves as competing with the satellite video purveyors who did not have that 5.5% extra mm. fee on the bill. And so they felt when people were spending, you know, 160 bucks on video, that 5% adds up. And that that would make a family less inclined to choose cable than satellite because of the extra fee. Now, I can't go much farther down the road speculating on your answer other than our historic experience with them, which is that they don't see us as a advantage for them as an offering that is appealing as yeah cable to watch because now i have a tv that's not hooked up it's netflix ready and we got it for the grandkids and when they come over you can put on a season of orca 
or <laughs> yeah. no, you can't. You can put on a season of any cartoon, Garfield. You can watch Garfield on nauseum, um, or you can get movies. And you know, the last time they sent me a notice, it was, "Would you like us to share on Facebook that you're watching Thomas the Train?" No, thank you. Um, but that's what was on my account. So you don't. I have, you know, some people just watch HBO and you can live, live stream and you can get other services. If you don't sit and watch sitcoms in the evening or, you know, just the network, network news, if you don't watch that. And but that makes you... Well, you can stream... The, the good news is you can stream these access center channels across the month. So there is an alternative way that is not simply cable. Um, there's some access channels that you can find on Roku, which mm. is a, another kind of online service. So we are diversifying the way that we distribute, okay. Good. which I think is really important to point out. Um, because we think that there may be other ways to fund this work. So one of the things that's happening is that in light of this $500,000 drop in revenue, our colleagues across the state have gone to their local municipalities. Many of them have not gone there before, asking for support. In our communities around Burlington, we've asked those municipalities to double their contributions, which most of them are doing, <coughs> if not all of them. So there is, we're, we're also doing philanthropic sort of the ETV way of raising money. So we're diversifying, but we may not be able to diversify quickly enough because it's a lot of work. Yes. So and that brings the cost back of the property tax and to get you out competing with things like the Kellogg Hubbard Library and a, just locally, home health services and a whole lot of other places. Precisely. So there's that. Yeah. So, so, so what my, go ahead, I thought that when you've got a license to provide, I don't I get cable because there are enough people live where I live. So, but it, one of when you won the, when you were able to get a certificate of public good, it was because you agreed to do this stuff. And you're saying that they've got the certificate of public good, they've agreed to do this stuff, but now they're going to court so they don't have to do it anymore? They um, were given a new certificate of public good, 11 years, with these conditions, and the cable company said, we object to these conditions, so we're going to court to fight the PUC. So can you pull their certificate of public well, good? Well, that would be a question for you to ask the PUC because that has occurred to us. Like, why wouldn't you say, oh, you don't want to serve? Okay, but I mean, Comcast is so heavily invested in the state, it's probably not the first thing people want to do. Yeah, if you pull Comcast. But it's a good question. Have it's a legitimate question to be asked because, you know, for, so, so wh why are we here? So we're here to raise your awareness they, about these issues. They agreed to the, they didn't agree. They didn't. they didn't agree. They said we don't agree with these no. conditions, so we're not going to. So they're currently operating under their they old certificate. Anyway. They didn't get it no. anyway. No. Oh, it's sure. Their old certificate is still operative. So they're operating like under stuff an old right. certificate okay. that expired in when? 2016, 17. And 2016. End of 2016. So this court case could go another two years. I mean. So, um, so we would like to talk with the legislature more about this, and we're not sure if the summer study committee is the way to do it. Or so we'd just like your advice about what you think we could do to discuss this as a public policy agenda. Well, I think and state probably to as part of the telecom. I mean, summer studies. If you're so limited, a we won't get funding, and b you can get lost. You're really part of the future of telecommunications. We kind of forget television anymore, uh, but it is there. And with the decline of local papers, there is a real question as to how do you, I mean, I can remember almost every word that got said in the city council appeared on the front page of the paper for better or worse. Um, the next day. I can remember wishing the days that didn't happen. Um, 
but there was coverage, and I was told it was nothing compared to the coverage you used to have when a reporter is listened with glasses against the door when you had a, you know, uh, an executive session. It has deteriorated to the point where, and I was amazed because it was after midnight at a budget session. I said, well, if there's any members of the public that are still listening, and we got calls saying we are still out here listening, um, that people do watch it. They don't come down and sit through the, they sit home in their jammies and their slippers and in a comfortable chair, and God love them, they listen to the town budget meetings. But that's it. There, there are no, and, it, and when you get reporters, they're stringers, and they have no idea what you did last year in your budget, or what any of the previous, yeah, thing leading up to it. So it, it is in the context of democracy. Where does this all fit in? And I think that would go into the telecom. It is part of the interconnectedness, but we have limited authority as does everybody else in regulating. I rem we put, what did we do to satellite a few years ago when there were tried runners to, under, tried to, tax it. Tried to put a tax <laughs> on it? Yet? Oh my. That was something. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, the really no. legislature's gonna tax your TV. Um, oh, stars with you. So what would be the best way to pursue some legislative discussion of this? Policy question and funding question. You've got us. You might want to also, to, if you're talking about funding, you might want to talk a to the governor's people. And it's a little late, but it's always good for them to understand. Mm -hmm. And talk to the appropriations committees. Mm -hmm. Because if you're looking, we might, we might find a fee or a tax we could raise, but that is a heavy lift um, to do that. Um, what was the governor's office response? They asked some really good questions. Mm -hmm. They um, asked good questions. Yeah, they do. <laughs> yeah, they asked some ask. really um, some, some really good questions. I mean, we went originally on this question of the um, Comcast reclassification of income, which mm -hmm. which affects the Comcast access centers. Mm -hmm. So that's 23 of the 25, not all of the access centers. And the, I think the thing that we came away with was they said, well, why would you be rewarding Comcast? Why would you be asking for funds to make up this different for just Comcast systems, which be a kind of way of rewarding them? Other cable operators would come and say, well, why are you doing that for Comcast systems? And, yeah. um, so that was one set of questions. They also wanted to know about return on investment. You know, they asked the RBA questions, mm -hmm. like what difference does it make, which were good questions. and we. I think have some good responses to that, um, and so it would. Yeah, so I mean, we see this as an important way to raise awareness within the legislature, who depends on these resources, and we feel a little reluctant to come in this year and say, "Hey, we need some money," because we just feel like it, it, this is a multi-year process, and it's also a bigger public policy question. So, so you're still in the planning and thinking and reflecting yeah. phase, really. I know. mean, so that's why we just like to, that's, so that's why we're thinking, you know, possibly a summer study or hooking on if you were going to have a, um, you know, a telecom study committee that maybe that needs to be part of that, because I think it isn't just as simple as saying we'd like an appropriation. This is a bigger, this is a bigger question. Yeah. This is about rights of way. You may actually have latitude that we haven't explored and researched that is, that requires some thought because this is, you know, this is a 35 year, 40 year asset, these access centers, and we need to figure out how to position them for the future. And we'd like to have the legislature in partnership in those conversations. I think you made the right step um, in getting in under the discussion of telecom um, because that's definitely where you are. And I think you know, we, the FCC is doing some interesting things. Um, we're on record as not particularly liking their net neutrality rules. Um, you know, but what happens in Washington can change radically in a four-year cycle. 
you know, um, we might get some relief that way, but uh, we should at least, you should be included. And because the goal isn't to lose what we've got. And maybe the solution is you morph into the new world of being internet stream. I, well, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I yeah, don't know. I doing some of that. Yeah, I think yeah. ultimately that is going to be what happens. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is what are the ways that we can support it financially? Mean, yeah. um, on the 20th of February, the. Um, and who's left out of that if, if that is your own well, exactly. way? Because that's what we were, as you yeah. know, we were talking about before you. Digital right. inclusion is a key piece of the work yeah. we do yeah. also. I think as we're finding as technology changes, older funding sources in utilities, in all of these things, are not keeping up with the new needs and we need to find a way to tap the folks that are now being regulated and are not paying. So just two things for you to be aware of. Um, we've asked the department, the department I think is moving ahead with a request for a workshop with the PUC. Okay, good. So um, right. we're gonna take it up there, which I think will be really good to have all the parties at the table yeah. to mm -hmm. talk about this, because I don't, it isn't actually just Comcast as a bad actor, it's, that's too simple. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all about trying to serve the communication yeah. needs of the people <laughs> right. in the state, and um, you know, we need to put aside any differences in view to figure out how we're gonna do that. Um, and then the second is on the 20th of February, Vermont Access Network is having a legislative day, so we'll be here, mm -hmm. and um, our fearless leader from the National Association for Community is coming, so I may, if it's all right with you, ask for him to come and testify. Just let us know, and, you know, just, we're starting to book two weeks out, so just let us know a day, and we'll hold you some time. Some time. Is it February 20th? 20th or 20th. Yeah. Would you like to add anything? Uh, there will be donuts on February 20th, so <laughs> please stop.